and as they race up towards the line, Midnight Court going away from the remainder, Brown Lads putting in a tremendous run, so is Bachelors Hall and Master H, but as they come up towards the line, it's Midnight Court, well clearly wins the Piper Champagne Gold Cup, Midnight Court wins it, it's a photo between Brown Lads. Is that any better? It is! It worked! This is my little makeshift studio. Or is it a shed in the garden, is it? <laughs> no. Yeah, but where did your interest in horses and racing come from? Well, it's actually from my grandfather, who I... Well, you might remember, because I'm from Swindon too. Oh, right, OK. Where and, um, well, I was in Blunsdon, but my grandparents oh, right. had Manor Farm. Yeah. Godfrey Francis. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, I do remember him, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, that's my granddad, and... Well, I'm glad, yeah, VWH. Yeah. He was a big supporter. I remember he used to go uh, to, when he used to go to the races, Grandma used to pack his Kit Kat lunchbox. <laughs> yeah. But I was yeah, only small, right. so I couldn't go. Yeah. Three flirties, oh, I'll tell my dad about that. Yeah, because yeah, mum said that your dad, she, uh, he did some, I think he judged her work in hunter classes when she... He did, yeah. Yes. Tell her he's still alive and going well. Okay, we'll do. So I I did some research and oh right, okay. <laughs> but I didn't actually find much about your uh, like where it all began, which I was quite pleased about because that means I can ask you. So you're obviously from Swindon, and your father was a railway fireman, but you had no connections to the racing world. So how did you actually get into wanting to be a jockey? Uh, well, I never wanted to be a jockey at all, oh. um, but I started riding when I was, I don't know, about four or five, I suppose. We used to do a milk round um, in Swindon. I used to live down near Commonweal School and the milkman used to do um, a round with a horse and cart. And I used to help him and he used to let me ride his pony in the afternoon. So I got keen that way. And then my parents um, bought a pony and kept it in a field, you know, just on buying an allotment. And then sort of went from there to doing gym carter, show jumping. Um, I used to go hunting every weekend with the VWH. I think your grandfather, he was um, a big supporter of the VWH. Um, and then when it came to time to leave school, it's a very expensive sport to get into, um, show jumping. So uh, Lambourne wasn't too far away. My dad said, you know, why don't you go and try and be a jockey? You know, you've spent the last 10 years riding every day. So that's what I did, and just really lucky. I went to um, Fred Winter, who I'd never heard of, mm. um, but he was champion jockey three times, champion trainer. Still the only person to have trained and ridden the winners of the Gold Cup, the champion hurdle in the Grand National. Oh, okay. um, and I went to him when I was 16 and stayed there until I, until I retired 15 years later. What was it like to first go there, not knowing really much when, about it? Well, the first, it's, it's a complete change from show jumping. So the first morning, I tied the horse up that I was meant to be mucking out, and I switched out a little transistor radio, which, you know, you have in every show jumping yard. I switched the radio on, and, of course, the horses weren't used to it, the race horses, and there are six loose ones. There's six broken head collars, the horses running all over the place. So that was the first bollocking. That was about 6 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And then I... Went to put the bridle on with the horse with his head still over the door. And that was another bollocking. And then I fell off first lot, a little, lovely little horse called Windsor Grey. But we had a very good head lad. I mean, he was a he was tough, but he was very good at his job and um, called Brian Delaney. And um, how you got through it. And it, 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 it was tough for the first few years. And I, I struggled with my weight and I wasn't going anywhere. And... I phoned my parents up after 18 months and I said, look, it's not working out. I'm going to come back home. And the next morning, um, I scored a horse called Osborne Eston, who was a bit of a tear away, but I got on well with him. And I think I won about 12 or 13 races on him and he got me going, basically. If I hadn't been for him, I'd have packed up and I'd gone off doing something else. So that kind of kept you 
going. Just, you always need a little bit of luck. Doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. That's what you want. Doesn't matter whether you set an off being a presenter. You know, it's. I mean, you know, I I rode with lots of really good lads who maybe broke a leg or an arm and then struggled to get back. I was touch wood. I was very lucky with injuries. You know, I broke a few bones in my time, but always had good horses to come back and ride. And, you know, what? no matter how hard you work, you've got to have the rub of the green. So after that, then, you didn't really look back? You didn't think, oh, actually, no, this still isn't for me? No, no. Once, once I got going, started riding, the weight um, was better. I, it used to yo-yo a little bit. It used to get two months off every summer. And I'd be 10 stone, two or three, um, on the last day of the season at Stratford. And then within... Four days, I'd be 12 stone, and then you'd have to get all the weight off again, and it was too hard. So in the, eventually, and I tried every type of diet myself, and Bob Champion um, went to this guy in um, London who eventually got warned off. You know, they're basically giving us, you know, amphetamine drugs. But, but um, eventually, you realise that there's no easy way. you just got to cut down on what you eat. And I used to eat the same stuff day in, day out, and keep the weight pretty constant. Life, life was much easier then. I didn't, I didn't like saunas. Um, pretty much a waste of time for me. Um, but the racing was lovely. My, my, the favourite part of all was schooling young horses. You know, it's, I'd be doing that today, you know, if I had the opportunity. Um, I remember I rode Looks Like Trouble. Um, who won a gold cup for Noel Chance. And he was just a lovely horse, um, really well-mannered, didn't pull, stood still when you came back to wash him down. You know, the, you get spoiled by riding a lot of good horses as a jockey. You know, as a trainer, it's different. You know, you've got all the problems if they've injured themselves or they're just not very good. But as a jockey, you just get off and say what you think and then get on another one. Have you ever ridden anything that's been not as well-behaved and it's been a bit... Okay. Oh, load, there's loads of those, and that's where you make, you know, that's luckily how you get on. Like I said, Oswald Destin, he, he was just, you know, he'd see a fence and he'd just bolt. Um, and the first time I rode him at Fontwell, I think I was last of 16, turning into the first fence down there, and probably about three lengths in front by the time we got to it, he used to just absolutely take off. And we, I actually rode him in a double bridle one day, but you just couldn't control him in the end. We used to just let him do his own thing, and he was happier doing that. And he was, he was the full brother to a horse we had called Sonny Summers. Um, and if you'd been less scrupulous, you could have had a little bit of a plot with him because Sonny Summers liked... They were absolutely identical, these two horses. Mm -hmm. But Sonny Summers wanted three miles on soft ground. Oswald Esteban wanted two miles on top of the ground. Um, if, they, if they'd been with another trainer, I think they'd have been swapping them over at regular. I wanted to ask, when you were at Fred Winter's yard, so you said that you got a few bollockings to begin with. After, oh yeah. Did it take you a while to settle in there or did you get used to it after a while because I'm sure it was quite a big difference from just you know show jumping and being at home to then being at a racing yard and Well it's completely it's completely different than show jumpers you know that you're you're in the yard all day um racing is much more professionally run or it certainly was in those days um and so there's, there's no chance of you know, maybe just leaving a stable door open yeah. and thinking the horse is going to be all right. Um, the boxes... Fred Winter was a wonderful guy. He used to train how he wanted to train. Um, the boxes were immaculate. Everybody had clean br um, brushes. The horses were clean. Everything was clean. The hostel was immaculate. We had a really good um, cook. Um, and it was just a, it was a, it was, I was blessed. It, I, I went there by no more than um, good luck. And as I said, it, it was I learnt so much. And, and a lot of other people went through there. Nicky Henderson, Oliver Sherwood. Uh, there's an endless list of people that learnt their trade. And I'm at um, live next door to Clive Cox at the moment, mm -hmm. and his head lad Martin Berry served his time under. Um, Brian Delaney and once you learn learn the right way to do things and how to look after horses properly it's very difficult you know to you know to do it any other way so everything that you know would you say you learned that from working for Fred Winter without it without a doubt um, 
you know, you just see the right way to do things. And, you know, I feel so. And it's the same with riding. If you start off doing the right things, it's difficult to do them badly. You know, I see so many people start off riding and they just start off down the wrong road and they're doing pony racing before they're ready. And you'll never get it back. You'll always be a certain type of rider if you don't learn the right way. Do you yeah, still so ride then? Most of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you still ride? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm, I've ridden out for um, about a month, but mm. I've um, rode a uh, two-year-old out, well, that must be six weeks ago, yeah. um, and I didn't, don't think it did either of us any good, so I haven't ridden out for a while. Oh. I've got a job to get on, and I've got a job to get off oh, at the moment, but I will, start, I will start again. Yeah. So I want to ask about your transition from when you retired to television. How did you find that? Was it a bit of a... A shock. Were you thrown into like a, maybe an interview or presenting, or did you slowly ease into it before retiring? No, I'd say it was. Um, I started tra a training for about a year, and I um, I built a yard and galloped, whatever. And Barry Hills was coming back from Manton, and he was short of boxes, and he wanted to rent my yard. So I said, right, okay, you come in here. Um, and Andrew Franklin, who used to own High Flyer Productions with John Fairley, they said, would you like to come and work on Boxing Day, help us out? And I said, yeah. And that was the start. I did 27 years. I've been really blessed. I've had two jobs in my life, one working for Fred Winter and one working for Andrew and John. And... On both occasions, I was working for nice people, with nice people. I did 15 years with one, 27 years with the other. So, you know, it makes a big difference if you're working with nice people. And I suppose it flowed one into the other then? Well, and also, Andrew Franklin was very good. You know, he'd, he'd give you... A, it, he knew television production inside out. And he just eased me into everything gently, um, just gave me a few pointers and the, his one bugbear, one thing for you to remember, it kills him when anyone says it's the first time ever. He always says, if it's the first time, it's the first time. You don't need to say ever. And loads of little things, absolutely um, precise about everything he does. You know, when even the little, if there's a little shadow on the screen, he's, he's a, again, like Brian Delaney, a very good man to learn from learn from um and i say to lots of people you know that the production's very good on sky but andrew franklin i think is really sorely missed and did you remember the first time that you went live uh yeah funny enough if you said to me um do a go, go in introduce the program from sandown park mm. i could have 50 goes and not get it right if you said it's live, you do it right the first time. Now, don't ask me why, but that's just the way it is. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And live, live. Once, once you're live television, you just get on and do it. But mm. it, when it, I don't know when, when they say, "Oh, we'll go and record it." Oh my God! I tell you, I could write three books on the cock-ups I've made, and you, just, you know, you, you struggle to get four words out. Yeah. But live, it just works for some reason. Yeah, it's something goes in your brain, and you're like, "Right, lights, camera, yeah. action." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Um, and if I'm, if I'm honest, I did it that all of the people on the production staff and the presenters, they were all incredibly nice. We had a very good team um, from top to bottom. But did I really enjoy it? It was, it was okay. I was really well paid. And as, as I said, I was working with nice people. But at the end of the day, you'd go home and you didn't really have anything to show for it. I'd rather build a wall or mow a lawn or do something at least you can look and see what you've done um, and as I said I did it for 27 years so that was you know, plenty long enough television 27 years yeah. yeah well you know when you said you prefer to build walls and stuff did you build your stables Clive Cox's yard I did yeah yeah wow. I mean, and I, it's something that I enjoy doing but that was a builder um, and I'm very happy getting outside you know building things and making things whether they fall down a couple of weeks later or not it's a different matter but no that was something I've always enjoyed yeah. um, and as I said you know that in riding have been the two you know loves in my life really yeah. 
Well, my partner does building, so I'm hoping that one day I can have a beautiful stables. <laughs> of course you will. You'll build the stables before the house, I expect. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in your free time, when you were on TV and presenting, in your free time, would you still ride and help out at yards? Or yeah. You would? Yeah. I think things have changed a lot. Um, you know, when I was at Fred Winters, the last year that I was riding... Um, I was still mucking out and riding out and these days you know a lot of jockeys they just come in and ride out and then go off and then you don't see them for the rest of the day so, so things have changed a lot and there's mm. jockeys agents and they've got nutritionists we've got Oaksy Centre in the village which is fantastic so um, yeah no, think things have changed for the better. So jockeys now don't do the mucking out? A, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of them don't um, uh, go in and muck out and ride out like they used to years ago. You know, they might go in and ride out and then that's it, they'll be finished for the day. So would that mean that uh, a lot of trainers would have to employ more staff? To... Um, I don't know that they employ more staff, but, you know, the judgments, um, Hector Crouch, Liam Keneary, Jerry McGrath, they come in and ride out regularly, Brian Toomey. Um, so they're just... The, you know, it's, the more good jockeys you have in a yard, the better it is. Um, so it's it's a different mix. You've got a lot of yard people. Years ago, you never had yard people. Everybody went in, mucked out, rode out, and then you went home. These days, I think there's about six or seven people that don't do anything but muck out. Oh, and they're happy doing it. Hmm. So during lockdown, what's it like on the yards? Well, um that it's, you don't see the vets nearly so much because the horses have only been sort of training at 90% so they don't get so many injuries. Mm -hmm. um, the yard is immaculate because we haven't got three or four people going racing every day so you're able to get on top of um, most of the things that normally get put to one side. And then hopefully racing will resume again on Monday. Mm -hmm. Clive's gone off to Kempton this morning with positive and golden order is two um, good horses that are going to run at Royal Ascot. Uh, um, so things hopefully will start getting nearly back to normal. He's had a horse box converted so that the lads can live in it oh, wow. and um, cook, cook in it so that there's no chance of them you know, going into a hostel and coming back with um, a virus. Um, all of the, the lads were tested in the yard yesterday and only Joe McGrath had any um, symptoms whatsoever and he'd been to Cheltenham obviously, you know, 12 weeks ago. It's, you know, it's it's been strange times, you know, for, for racing and jumping. I feel really sorry for Brian Hughes, you know, champion jockey for the first time, and he's missed out on all the celebrations. Mm. Um, but, like, years ago, well, say years ago when I was riding, we had two months off every summer. We didn't race from the end of May to the beginning of August. So, you know, there was nothing new there, and maybe it'll prompt people to start doing the same. I don't know. In that a two months that you had off, was that like a rest period? You would just yeah. Recuperate and... All the horses would get turned out, boxes would get cleaned from top to bottom, um, and then you'd start again. And some trainers used to target the early season races. You know, the likes of John Jenkins, um, David Barons, uh, Les Cannon, and then you know the bigger battalions would get going later on. Is they pretty much as they do now. Hmm. So there's not much of a rest now, though, nowadays, is there? Not at all. And I'm, and I'm, listen, I'm sure that if you're involved, um, then people are happy racing every day. But to me, ugh, the thought of going to a ride in a, you know, in a steeplechase on a really hot afternoon, mm. it just doesn't seem right. Much better going round Lingfield on a wet afternoon in January. Um, mm. I don't know whether the horse is in. Well, maybe maybe some do. I was thinking about that the other day. Whether you know, I, I hate the heat and the thought of being a competitive athlete um, in Barcelona or somewhere would kill me. But some athletes presumably absolutely thrive on it, and so maybe you know, obviously some horses do. But I suppose there's plenty that don't. So you know, when racing kicks back on Monday and hopefully it all goes well, what are there any precautions put in place? So obviously, I know there won't be. Like a crowd or anything, but for you know to ensure that no one gets any viruses or COVID. I think I th I think there are plenty of precautions in place. I 
think they're talking about the jockeys wearing face masks, which is bonkers. Um, can't begin to think what it's like riding with a mask on in this hot weather. Mm. Um, there's only going to be um, two handlers to any horse going in the stalls. Um, there'll be social distancing everywhere you go and and the normal things that you'd expect. But as I said, Clive's gone the extra um, distance and put facilities in the horse box so that the lads don't have to mix with other lads. You know, we don't want somebody coming back, bringing it into the yard and then having five or six staff off. Mm. But hopefully, um, fingers crossed, things will start moving forward. So did you say that the reason why they're now living in the boxes is so that they won't bring any germs back? Is that what you meant? Yeah. 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 He's going. What he's going to do? That he's had the horse box converted so that they don't have to go into the lads' hostel to eat or drink or mix with the other lads. So they can go there. They can. They're completely self-sufficient, and then they can. Um, well, well, they'd be far less likely to pick anything up. Mm. Hopefully. I always wondered uh, on like a race day. Did you go there in the morning, or, or is it like a hostel stay? On on a which day? On a race day. What if I if you're riding? Yeah. Uh, no, no. If you're right, if you as a jockey, this is where I'm not sure how they're going to work it out. They were talking at one stage that the jockeys were going to have to go into isolation and stay there somewhere for a fortnight. Mm. You know, if if you're a jockey, you just turn up an hour before your first ride, and then um, you'd be there for the afternoon. Oh, okay. I always wondered. I don't know if it was yeah, like a you stay away, so you're there ready to go in the morning. No, no, well, all, it all depends, you know, um, I used to hate staying away from home, you know, even Aintree, which is three hours away, I'd go up and come back every day rather than stay there, you know, if you've got weight problems, you'd stay away, you'd wake up in the morning, what am I going to do all day, um, until racing starts at two o'clock, and it was easier to come home, ride out, and then start the day again, you know, get into a routine. So going back to your diet when you were a jockey and you said you uh, had a problem with your weight, was it almost clean eating but not many carbohydrates? No, I used to eat exactly what I wanted but in very small quantities, you know, and so that oh, no, nothing worse than as soon as somebody says you can't eat something, you want to eat it, yeah. so just saying, right, okay, I'm going to have two baked beans and, you know, just much smaller quantities and then you 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 know everybody everybody's different their, their bodies work in different ways but you know you find out a, a routine that suits you and then um it's it's much much easier to um get into a, a regular system of and a, and a regular diet but life's so much easier then you don't have the highs and lows you're waking up in the morning and knowing you've got to lose six pounds between um, seven o'clock and two o'clock. Richard Pittman regularly used to lose ten pounds. He'd have pee pills, which are banned now. You know, he'd regularly lose ten pounds from first thing in the morning till going racing in the afternoons. So you really? know, it's not good for you. Yeah. So I assume that's just weighing out just fluid. liquid. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. And then of course you'd have a few drinks and it all go back on again, and then you do exactly the same thing the, the following day. Terry Billicum was the same, but that's just what jockeys did, mm. and then he'd live in the sauna. But you know, think. Things are better, you know. As I said, they got nutritionists, and it's yeah. much better now. Do you, so, were you allowed to drink alcohol? Uh, no. No. Well, you you were you were. I'm, I'm you know, I don't drink anyway. So, yes. Because that yeah. I, one less vice. Because alcohol's got a lot of calories in it, hasn't it? Yes, but um, so anyway, luckily, um, I don't drink alcohol, but I drink a lot of Coca Cola, so that's probably ten times worse okay. for you. But <laughs> but you, you listen, you you do whatever suits you. Mm. That's the main thing. Yeah, because Mick was saying that your body gets accustomed to whatever you're Yeah, doing. Mick's very good. Mick's hardly put on any weight since he packed up. He's very good. He's very disciplined. So after you've retired, do you have to slowly ease into a different diet so that you don't put on those weights? <laughs> about, about an hour after you've packed up normally, you, <laughs> you, you don't ease into anything. You just start binging. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, is it? It depends who you are. So, you know, some jockeys put on plenty of weight and others just carry on just as they were. And I pretty much like Mick. I have uh, a question. I want to know if you've got like, a memorable moment in your career that stands out. Uh, memorable moments, probably winning the Gold Cup for Fred Winter, more for him than for myself. Mm -hmm. um, he'd won every big race, but he'd never won a Gold Cup. He'd have the favourite. 
he'd had I think he'd had about four favourites yeah. um, and they'd all got beaten for one reason or another and then um, it was a time I'd just been banned for three months and I'd just come back and I was riding a horse called uh, Midnight Court for some really nice owners that mm. we had um, called George and Olive Jackson um, so that was one memorable moment um, I watched that last night and other than that, not really. No, I think, you know, it's all in the past. Yeah. I mean, I'm amazed I can remember some of the names, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I watched that footage on Midnight Court last night, because obviously I wasn't born, so... <laughs> no, funny that. <laughs> Thank goodness for YouTube. <laughs> yes, uh, but he was, a, he, he was a good horse, and as I said, he had some nice owners. Uh, Richard Pittman um, was a big help to me when I went to Fred Winters. Oh, he really? was... He was a he was a really good person. Well, he still is a good person. He went on to present it afterwards, but he's he's been a big help to me throughout my career. Do you ever go back to Swindon? Yeah, yeah. Swindon? Well, I haven't been there for a few months because of the lockdown. Yeah. But yeah, no, I absolutely go there all the time. So you know, I live in Lambeth. It's the closest yeah. uh, town, really. Swindon and Newbury. Mm. Um, it's amazing how it's changed. Yeah. I used to go used to go to school in. Um, a park and there wasn't a house from the back of the school um, till you got to Highworth. Now it's all houses, buildings and industrial estates. Now it's really, mm. you know, it's a big place now. So Swindon's a nice place. I don't know how the football team's going to get on. Mm. Um, I've one or two problems at the moment, but I often go and watch them play. Oh, you do? Oh, Mum watches them. She's taking me yeah, to yeah. the games. And there's, there's a local... Um, company brewers called Arkles, they've mm. put absolute fortunes into um, Swindon Town over the years. Yeah. Uh, they've been tremendous supporters. Willie Carson, of course, was a director. Um, Julian Wilson um, and Lou McCarry was manager there for a while, who used to love his racing. He had a couple of very good horses with David Nicholson. So, yeah, no, it's, it's a good place, Swindon. Mm. Do you have a house there? Or? No, I live in Lambourne and no, that's it. That's it. One house is enough for me. <laughs> I always have a question from my mum, but you've answered it already. She wanted to know if you still ride. So, you still ride. Do you have horses of your own, or do you just go and... I've got one horse with Clive, and I would... I'd ride, but I love schooling. I love schooling young horses, but I stopped doing it for the simple reason that, you know, if you go and get on young horses these days, every time you get on one, you're denying a young jockey an opportunity to get on and do it and I thought if I was 16, 17 working in a yard and some old geezer was coming down riding it and I thought it's just not fair so I don't do it I'd like to do it but I don't do it it's just you know it's just not fair but you know that's one of the great joys of life schooling young horses for the first time and getting on something that really knows its job. Do you coach any jockeys? Uh, don't, I'll give him one or two out. There's a really nice boy who works for Lucinda Russell um, up the north called Thomas Wilmot. I help him a little bit. He's a lovely lad and he's very, he's a good learner. Um, and I don't, I'm always there if anybody needs a helping hand. Um, and it's nearly always the same things that they do wrong. You know, you can see, see it very easily. So I didn't know that you were an author too. So I read last night that you've written quite a few books. I have, read yeah, a long time ago, yeah. So written what, about, 20, about 22 books. I yeah. thought you were going to say you read them all last night. No. <laughs> have you got one you recommend that would be like a good one to read first? Um, well, Stalking Horse is probably a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm reading East of Eden at the moment, which is a brilliant book. Mm. Uh, so don't read East of Eden and go read one of mine because you'll realise that it's not as good as it should be. <laughs> But that, no, it's all right. They're all right. They sold okay. Did all right. So, yeah. what got you into writing? Was it just creativity? I wrote um, an autobiography when I packed up, mm -hmm. um, which I did myself. And then I had my phone tapped, and the guy that acted for me when it went to court said, "Do you fancy writing some books like Dick Francis?" And I said, "Yes." And we did three together. And then he didn't want to go on anymore, and I went on doing it myself. And I've always had people editing them, but I, you know, I've done the major part of them. So have you been doing any creative writing? Well, I don't miss it. I can show it's, it's, it's either in you, isn't it? It was hard work every oh. year. So you don't write anymore? No. No? Not even in lockdown? 
<laughs> the odd letter and that's about it. Yeah. So what have you been doing in lockdown to keep busy? Um, gardening mostly, yeah. cutting trees down, um, painting. Um, God, there's always something to do. Mm. Absolutely. You know, we've got a quite a lot of horses here and they're always breaking things or doing something. So, um, yeah, no, there's no shortage. I'm really lucky to have lots to do. I mean, yeah. Um, I feel incredibly sorry for people that have been stuck, you know, and can't get out of their house. You know, I walk straight outside and I've got 20 things to get on with every day. But to wake up and have nothing to do must have been awful for people. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm in London, so I'm just in a flat, but I've been trying to think outside the box to keep busy. Right, now, right ab absolutely. That's all my questions, but thank you so much for... Pleasure, pleasure indeed. Right, well, I wish you best of luck anyway. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe see you in the future. All right, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, have All a good right. day. Bye. Bye. Bye.